Hey, this is Bill Fletcher, and welcome to the Real News Network. You know, every so often, there's an interview that I have to do where I am just so excited. I mean, just, I, this is what I want to do. And I'm looking for the opportunity, the time. And that's what tonight's interview really is. It's, it's a, a, and a look at the Palestine, the left in Palestine, in a way that I don't see very much, and, and not just the contemporary, but looking historically. Let me explain. Published in the Plus 972 magazine and later reposted by Portside on July 30th, was really one of the most interesting articles I've read concerning the left in what was known as the Palestine Mandate, a territory that was later divided between Israel and Jordan. The article entitled, A Century After Its Founding, The Israeli Communist Party is at a Crossroads, gives a detailed, well-researched look at the evolution of the Israeli communist movement, its successes and failures, and its legacy. For me, however, it was an article that raised serious questions as to the challenges facing and the future for left politics in a settler colonial state, not only in Israel, but in other countries, including the United States, countries that have been rooted in settler colonialism. Our guest, the author, Joel Bynan, is the Donald C. McClatchlin Professor of History and the Professor of Middle East History Emeritus at Stanford University. He is an author of books and articles on social and cultural history and the political economy of Egypt, Palestine, Israel, and on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and someone I can call a friend. Joel, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Bill, for that very generous introduction. Well, it had the benefit of being true. <laughs> um, Joel, I, I want to just start with why? Why now? Why that article? I mean, this is a lengthy article, and I want to just tell the readers, it's a lengthy article. And when I saw it first, I said, all right, I have to put it aside. Once I started reading it, frankly, I couldn't stop reading it. Well, the immediate occasion for writing and publishing it now is that this past July is indeed the 100th anniversary of the founding of the Communist Party of Palestine, uh, which uh, transmogrified into the Communist Party of Israel. Uh, so the editors of Plus 972, and let me put a plug in for that. It's one of the very best English language sources for uh, following contemporary Israel-Palestine. Uh, I've known them for a long time, and they invited me to write this article because they knew it was something that I had long been interested in. You know, it was. It's, this may sound kind of weird, Joel, but in reading the article, it, well, let me just say to the to the the viewers, the article really looks at not just the construction of this party, but it looks at the development of the revolutionary left in Palestine and the development of well, among uh, Jewish members as well as Arab members, the conflicts, et cetera, um, and which we'll get into. But one of the things that struck me in, in reading it is I found myself thinking about German immigrants to the United States in the 19th century, Marxist German immigrants, and how they, for the most part, did not get set the colonialism, and did not get race in the United States. And they, they brought with them this idea of Marxism that, and I say this as a Marxist, but they, it had no relationship to the situation in, in the United States. And I'm wondering, when you were writing this, it feels to me like many of the immigrants, the settlers, the Jewish settlers, they came even as leftists, and they were missing something in a very fundamental way. I think that's true. So we could say more broadly that mid-19th century, late 19th century Marxism didn't get race and empire, uh, and ultimately, the Second International fell apart uh, over issues of the empire. 
Uh, and even after World War I, uh, the formative moments of the Palestine Communist Party uh, take place against the background of that split in the Second International, the emergence of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, and the formation of the Communist International. And people are still not very clued into uh, how we're going to deal with race and empire and settler colonialism. Uh, within a revolutionary uh, Marxist framework. I and mean, Lenin laid out some bold and radical new ideas, but there were lots of struggles uh, about putting flesh on those bones. And uh, in, I'm glad you brought up this comparative dimension. One of the things that dropped out of the article for length is that I had in there a couple of paragraphs comparing what happened in Palestine to what happened in South Africa. Mm -hmm. So in South Africa, you also had a white settler uh, immigrant class, a very militant working class that engaged in major mine uh, strikes, the Rand Revolt. And there's a famous picture of, of a banner being carried by white mine workers during the Rand Revolt that says, workers of the world unite for a white South Africa. Mm -hmm. Well, that wasn't going to work too well <laughs> there. And eventually... Uh, thanks to the emergence of the African National Congress and the overlapping membership between the African National Congress and the Communist Party of South Africa, uh, white South Africans learn how to deal with this issue. In Palestine, that never happened in quite that way. Why? Let's talk. I'm, that's what I'm interested in. This is really interesting comparing South Africa and, and Palestine. Why didn't it happen? Why wasn't there among the settlers uh, the kind of the, the, the communist settlers, not settlers in general? Why wasn't there that sort of epiphany that something very different was needed? So there are two reasons. First, uh, if we're talking about the settlers, the Jews, uh, very, very few of them came as communists. Most of them came as left Zionists, and then they saw things that indicated that, no, there is no such thing as socialist Zionism. Uh, if we want to be socialists, we have to abandon Zionism. But OK, these people's entire political, cultural, social formation was within a Zionist, Hebrew-speaking, Jewish community. They didn't know any Arabs. They certainly didn't know any Arabic except for a tiny, tiny number of them. Um, and so they were socially completely isolated from the vast majority of the population of the country who were Arabs up through the end of the British mandate in 1948. Two-thirds of the country was Arab. Uh, second, the Palestinian Arab National Movement had a particularly reactionary social character. Uh, there were lots of different strands in the movement, but the main body of the movement was led by landlords, who were often absentee landlords, who rack-rented uh, peasants who were largely sharecroppers, uh, and uh, who had no social program whatsoever. Now, there were Arab parties that formed uh, with a more progressive uh, social and political platform, a more explicitly anti-imperialist platform, because these uh, uh, Arab large land owner types uh, did not want to confront British imperialism until there was absolutely no choice left for them. Uh, so there were other elements that formed uh, in the emerging Palestinian working class, in the emerging Palestinian secular intelligentsia, but they were much weaker, relatively speaking, uh, than, say, the ANC, which became the hegemonic liberation movement in South Africa. The progressive forces among Palestinian Arabs never uh, attained that kind of stature. So if I understood correctly, sometime in the 1920s, the, uh, the Communist International basically 
uh, rattles the cage of the Jewish members of the uh, Palestine party and says, you got to do something different. Um, at what point is there an identifiable Arab communist contingent, e you know, with either within the party or outside of the party? So when the party was formed in 1923, there were no Arab members. And the Comintern said, you have to be a party of the people of the country, and the people of the country are overwhelmingly Arab, so get with it. So they recruited Arabs, and they sent them to Moscow for political education, uh, a dozen of them in the 1920s. And um, only about four of them came back to be members of the party. One of them ended up uh, dying in the Spanish Civil War. Others of them went this way and that way. And consequently, it wasn't until about the time of the broad Arab revolt, what's called the Great Arab Revolution in Palestine of 1936 to 1939, that you had a broad radicalization uh, of Palestinian youth and the very beginnings of the formation of a, a Palestinian working class that was very much accelerated by the outbreak of World War II and the establishment of British military and logistical facilities in Palestine. So during the Arab revolt, a left uh, point of view emerged Mostly, I would say at that point, outside the party. Mostly, yeah. this was um, people who rejected the leadership of the large landowners and who uh, began in the fall of 1937 to conduct a guerrilla warfare based among the peasantry. Uh, and uh, that was a fairly powerful movement. It took the British 30,000 soldiers to put it down on the eve of World War II, and ultimately the British made some significant concessions to the Palestinian national movement as a result of that uprising, but the uprising was pretty brutally and thoroughly defeated. Once there was a broad Palestinian working class, about 100,000 urban workers by the middle of World War II. Then intellectuals within the Communist Party who had sympathized with that broader social movement during the Arab Revolt are looking now to these workers, and they're not happy with the party's approach to the multinational working class. And they eventually forced a split in the party that resulted in the formation of the National Liberation League, which was an all Arab, not communist, but let's say Marxism uh, political formation that sought to be a united front against fascism type party of the kind that you had in Vietnam and many of the countries that were occupied uh, by Japan or say also in Greece or Yugoslavia, you had formations like that. After World War II, when we start to see this massive influx of uh, Jewish refugees from Europe as a result of the Holocaust. What was the attitude of the party, the Communist Party, towards this migration, this influx, and ultimately on the debates that were going on at the United Nations about the future of the Palestine Mandate? So this is where it becomes very distinctive and complicated. Because this factor didn't occur in any other place where uh, there was a settler colonial society and a communist party somehow emerged, because there was a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, and the thing that uh, communists all around the world said was, well, uh, the Western countries aren't letting in any of, or very many, of the Jewish survivors of the Holocaust. There were about 
225,000 of them in displaced persons camps uh, throughout Europe uh, after the war, and very small numbers of them were allowed into any Western countries. Uh, and whereas the Jewish community in Palestine said, yeah, I'll let them come here, but the British had closed the doors as of 1939. That was one of the concessions uh, to the Arab revolt to very uh, strictly limit the number of, of Jewish immigrants into Palestine. So on a humanitarian basis, communists said, well, these are the among the primary victims of fascism. They, they have to be allowed to rebuild their lives somehow, somewhere. Uh, and yeah, the West, uh, the Western imperialist countries are being piggish by excluding them. But uh, if they can get to Palestine, OK, welcome. And of course, from the Palestinian Arab point of view, that's a disaster because they see that what the Zionists want to do is grow the population of the Jewish community in Palestine so that uh, after 1942, that was it was very clear what the Zionist goal was to establish a Jewish state in as much of Palestine as they could. And so the party is torn about how to respond to this, this influx of, of people. So no Jewish state, but... Right. Yeah, we have sympathy for the victims of fascism, and we think they should go wherever they want to go, but the countries where they want to go don't want to let them in. So if they do get let into Palestine, uh, we hope we'll be able to speak to them uh, and, and to recruit them uh, into the uh, ambience of the communist movement, which was not a ridiculous idea because uh, the Soviet Union was very popular in Palestine uh, during and after World War II because it was, after all, the Soviet Union. That was the main force in the defeat of Nazism. It was the Battle of Stalingrad that turned the tide of the war in Europe. The Soviets lost 20 million citizens in the fight against fascism. Um, Jews had enormous respect and affection for that. Even people who weren't particularly communists, just progressive Jews who espouse some version of labor Zionism, uh, were still very friendly uh, to the Soviet Union. So uh, it wasn't ridiculous to assume that you could bring these refugees into some kind of uh, pro-Soviet communist uh, 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 alignment. On the other hand, if you're a Palestinian Arab, no, you don't want anything. I mean, great. I mean, they, of course, the communists for sure had sympathy for the Jews, but let let the Europeans pay the price for what they did to the Jews, not us. We didn't do it. And this then takes us to one of the episodes that I find very curious in the history of the of the time, in the in 1947, uh, when the debates are going on about the future of the Palestine Mandate, um, the Soviet Union ends up supporting a partition, and uh, this created immense confusion within the Arab world, um, within the Arab left, and specifically. Of the Arab uh, communist movements, what was the impact within the Palestine party? So the, at that point in 1947, uh, there were two parties. There was the Communist Party of Palestine, which was 100% Jewish, even though it bore the official party name. And there was the National Liberation League, which wasn't formally a communist party, but both parties went to the uh, January, February 1947 London Conference of Communist Parties of the British Empire. And uh, the Jews, the Jewish party said, uh, a Jewish national community has been established in Palestine. Uh, and as such, it has the right to self-determination. We don't think that that right should be expressed in the form of an independent state, but there is a Jewish national community here, even though we don't like the process that brought about its formation. The Arab party, the National Liberation League said, 
yeah, there are Jews in Palestine, and we want an independent democratic Palestinian state, and all the Jews who live in Palestine and who are uh, uh, citizens of British Mandate Palestine, they'll be equal citizens in this new and democratic Palestine that we want. So the two local parties had two different lines. And the Soviet Union sympathized more with the line of the Arab party. Why did they change their mind? They changed their mind for two, maybe two and a half reasons, we can say. Mm -hmm. Reason number one, the overriding reason, they wanted to get the British imperialists out of Palestine. So whatever was going to weaken British imperialism in Palestine, and by extension, more broadly in the Middle East, because the British and secondarily the French were still then the, the, the dominant European powers in, in the region, whatever was going to advance that, good, we're, we're for it. Second, both the Jewish communists and the left as Jewish Zionists, uh, people from what, what became uh, the United Workers Party, Mapam, uh, which was rooted in, in the kibbutz movement, the Hashem or kibbutz movement, they sent emissaries to the Soviet bloc, where sometimes they were talking to their brothers and sisters and cousins and said, look, we are the real communists here, not the Communist Party. The Communist Party doesn't have any social base in the Jewish community. We have a social base in the Jewish community. We represent 20% of the Jewish community of Palestine. We have kibbutzim. We have cooperatives. We have all sorts of things. And this was true. That, that was all true. We are the real communists. You support the establishment of the Jewish state. And we are going to have a pro-Soviet Jewish state emerge here. Well, Soviet Union was not acting out of deep principle, so that sounded like a pretty good deal. Uh, and and many uh, elements of communist parties in uh, Eastern Europe uh, embraced that idea, especially Czechoslovakia. Um, then I think we have to say that Gromyko, the foreign minister of the Soviet Union, in the speech that he gave to the uh, United Nations, when he announced the possibility that the Soviet Union would endorse partition, said, yeah, uh, the Jews deserve something. I mean, it's a very Eurocentric perspective, and he's not paying too much attention to what we would call today the Global South, and its understanding of what World War II was about and the aftermath and all of that is that the the, the, the Western imperialist powers let the Nazis butcher the Jews. They didn't protect them. They aren't providing a refuge for them after the war. Uh, we kind of understand why they might want to have their own state, and it would be criminal not to let them have that if that is the only resolution to their problem. So that's why the Soviet Union did what it did. And again, from the point of view of the Palestinian Arabs, um, yeah, we understand the Soviet Union's motives, but this doesn't speak to what our needs are here at all. And consequently, uh, the left in Palestine and throughout the Arab world was uh, dealt a pretty heavy blow by the decision of the Soviet Union to support the par partition of Palestine into an Arab state and a Jewish state, especially since the Arab state didn't ever come about. Right. Now, it's interesting what you were describing in terms of the conflict represented at the London meeting, because the two sides that came from Palestine and presented their cases, it, it felt to me in reading your article like that theme just keeps going to the present. Yep. Two very different analyses of the situation. And, I'm, and I'd like you to talk some about how that those conflicts were addressed? I mean, to what extent was there an attempt to, particularly post-48, to resolve those? And, uh, and it relates to a question I want to ask you about the current situation. But particularly post-48, I mean, well, what happened? So I would say that there was never a serious effort to resolve the question. And one reason for that is the pro-Soviet dogmatism and the Stalinist cult of personality 
uh, that prevailed everywhere in the international communist movement. The Soviet Union laid down the line, and that was the line. And yeah, internally in the party, there were people who had this interpretation of it and that interpretation of it. But the, there was a real political function of dogmatism. I talk about this a lot more in my book, Was the Red Flag Flying There, than I do in the article. Dogmatism served to unite Arabs and Jews around the line that the Soviet Union put down, and that preserved party unity. Now, underneath that uh, official unity, there were tensions, but there was no way to resolve those tensions because nobody could come and say, wait, this is Palestine, it's not Czechoslovakia, it's not Poland. The, we have a very particular set of social dynamics here, settler colonialism, Zionism, a worldwide Jewish people, which is providing external support for the settler colonial uh, uh, Jewish community here, uh, a, a continuing alliance with imperialism, first French imperialism, then American imperialism. There was no way to talk about those things and to come up with a creative solution. Uh, and again, compare that with what happened in South Africa, where the African National Congress emerged and it became the hegemonic leadership of the Black African community. And then it was clear, well, if we want liberation and, and we're white people or, or uh, uh, colored or, or Indian or whatever in South Africa, well, yeah, we, we have to find a way to make an alliance with the African National Congress. There, that didn't happen uh, in post-1948 Israel until the formation of the Democratic Front for Peace and Equality in 1976, which still exists. So that's a front led by the Communist Party. Um, in which non-communist elements have participated more or less in various periods. It's a very complicated ebb and flow of forces, non-communist forces in and outside the front. Uh, but ultimately, the dogmatism of the Communist Party and its anti-democratic political traditions prevailed so that that front has never really appealed to a, a, a broad number of, of Jews. Uh, the Jews do vote for it, uh, but it's in the, the number is in the tens of thousands out of a population uh, uh, inside Green Line Israel that is the citizens of about 7 million. So, you know, we could go on for three hours, Joel, um, on this. I mean, there's so many questions that I have. I, I want to ask two more in the interest of time. One is, it may sound like a strange question, um, and then I want to talk about the present or the, the future. In light of what you described in this split that existed within the Palestinian uh, communist movement pre-1948 and then immediately after, why wasn't there the merger of the Ba'athists among the Arab leftists in response to, let's call it the ambiguity within the, what becomes the Israeli communist movement? So the emergence of an Arab nationalist left, the Ba'ath Party, which I would argue in historical retrospect turns out not to be an actual left party of any sort, whatsoever, but it certainly appeared to be that in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And Nasser, especially as the uh, Nasser regime radicalized, became closer to the Soviet Union. And remember, we're in a period historically when proximity to the Soviet Union is part of the definition of what it means to be left, which is its own problem, right. in my view. Right. Um, so when that happened, and it was, I would say, objectively the case, that Arab nationalism, and especially left Arab nationalism led by Nasser and the Ba'ath and the Algerian National Liberation Front, um, so Algeria, Egypt, Syria, Iraq, and also then a very important movement in South Yemen that was aligned with them, that was 
those forces were the major challenge to imperialism. And the Arab uh, elements in the party were, yeah, right. Uh, we want to be part of that. And the Jewish elements in the party uh, absolutely rejected it. They, I mean, they rejected it for some bad reasons, racism. They rejected it for some good reasons because Arab nationalism never had an answer to what we're going to do with the Jews there in, in Israel. Um, they never they never put forward the kind of program that the African National Congress did. African National Congress put forward a very powerful democratic program. One person, one vote. How do we argue against that? that that's the definition of democracy. Um, so, but that isn't what any of the uh, Arab, left Arab nationalists put forward, Arab communists put that forward that, but they were, for the most part, with the exception of Iraq and Sudan, where the communist parties were quite powerful until they were eliminated, um, they weren't a major force in the Arab world. So that line didn't exist. And then when, uh, uh, so when the forces that became Fatah emerged and began uh, carrying out bombing raids in Israel and civilians were killed and such. And people said, no, well, they don't distinguish between the army and the civilians. And the, the Jewish people are, are totally traumatized still today by the, the, the Holocaust. Certainly in the 60s, that there were many survivors. Who, and, and that was by, through the Eichmann trial projected everywhere in Israel and globally on, on the global Jewish community. Uh, and uh, you had to have and you would have had to have a, an exceptionally clear-headed and generous Arab leadership to find a way to embrace that uh, in, in a progressive framework. And it didn't happen. So final question. Um, what does this mean going forward in terms of a presence of a socialist left within Israel and within the occupied territories. Um, wh what are the conclusions that you've come to? So first we need to say, and this isn't in the article because it's a very broad argument, that the socialist left everywhere in the world is under enormous pressure and, and has retreated at the same time that there have been some advances. Uh, in the United States, we could talk about the growth of uh, democratic socialists of America and, and comparable uh, phenomena. Ethno-nationalism is the rising force globally and in Israel. I mean, you have people who I would not hesitate for a second to call religio-national fascists in the government in Israel. Uh, and they are the directors of government policy. They are not a fringe element in the government that was let in there because they control a certain number of votes. I mean, they were made part of the coalition for that reason, but they are also ideologically the driving force of government policy. What can a left do in this situation? So first, they're, the Israelis have cleverly diced up the territory under their control between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean into several different pieces. There's the West Bank, which is under military occupation, but there's 700,000 Jewish settlers who live there who are equal citizens of the state of Israel. I mean, maybe even we could say more than equal citizens because of the resources that are expended to protect and, and, and develop their communities are much greater than in most other Jewish communities inside uh, the Green Line. There's the Gaza Strip, which has its own outrageously barbaric regime of an open air prison. There's East Jerusalem, where the Arab uh, uh, minority of East Jerusal of Jerusalem uh, are uh, residents, but not citizens, with minor exceptions. And then there's the Palestinians who are citizens of the state of Israel and who comprise 20% of the citizens of Israel. So navigating just that is a problem of enormous complexity. Now you have this astonishing social movement that's gone on uh, in Israel 
among Israeli citizens, primarily among the Jewish citizens, but in recent weeks, increasing numbers of Palestinian citizens have joined in the movement and spoken from the platforms of the weekly demonstrations that happen every Saturday night in every significant uh, city and town in Israel. This is a movement uh, that uh, has, uh, on, on many occasions, uh, had hundreds of thousands of people uh, in the street, and in some cases, uh, militant confrontations with the police, uh, shutting down uh, major highways and uh, uh, real street battles and, and so on. And the movement hasn't come up with any thing that answers the question, what does it mean to have a democracy with equality for Jews and Arabs? Just among the citizens and addressing the occupation, the main leaders don't want to do that at all. Now, there is an anti-occupation block within this social movement, uh, and it has grown from utterly marginal and insignificant and despised. I mean, the leaders of the main uh, body of the movement uh, actually uh, beat them up on a couple of occasions early on. Now that doesn't happen. Now they're tolerated. Now they are uh, able to participate in the demonstrations. Um, they don't get to speak from the main stage in Tel Aviv, which has the most uh, conservative uh, orientation of all of the uh, uh, weekly demonstrations. Uh, they're much more open to an anti-occupation and equality for all message in Haifa and Jerusalem and Beersheba than in Tel Aviv and the surrounding suburbs and exurbs. And among that anti-occupation block, uh, there are an array of forces that have put forward the formula of a state of all its citizens, meaning full equality for Arab and Jewish citizens. And such a state, almost by definition, would be inclined to deal with the question of the occupation. Uh, two states, one state, federation, confederation, all sorts of ideas are out there. Personally, uh, I'm not very convinced that two states is a viable idea anymore, but, that, but there are forces among those people in Israel who would still uh, uphold that. So this exists. And it has gotten more public space and more energy as a result of being part of this unprecedented mass movement in Israel. Whether that will translate into a political party that wins any significant number of votes in the next election, whenever that will be, uh, totally unclear. Joel, I, I just, this is just an amazing discussion. And I want to really encourage our viewers to read this article. Uh, as I mentioned before, it was in Plus 972 magazine. Uh, it was also reposted uh, in uh, Portside. Um, and it's, I just feel it's a must read and it's very provocative. Uh, you didn't pull punches and and raise questions that I think people need to be thinking about uh, because the relevance is not just in Israel and Palestine, the occupied territories. Uh, it's relevant to a number of places where there's uh, countries that either were based on settler colonialism or where settler colonialism continues to exist and has in very many cases frustrated the development of left movements. So, Joel Benin, I just really want to appreciate your joining us on, on this program. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bill, for having me. Pleasure. And this is Bill Fletcher with The Real News Network thanking you. Take care. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.